in here because you're here with us this morning. We're going to praise the Lord together. We're going to worship His name this morning. I'm going to ask you first of all, though, if you'd be kind enough to stand. Turn to hymn number 514. And we're going to have a word of prayer to begin our service this morning. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your house today. There is blessings in this place because you've promised them, Lord. I pray that we all might receive that blessing, the blessing that we need for each and every heart here in this place. Lord, uh, as we celebrate what you've done for us in our lives, for our salvation, Lord, we pray that we might be mindful that that's something that we can impart and give to others that we come in contact with. Help us to do that, Lord. In everything that's done and said in this place, may it glorify you today. And help us to live for you in a way that would be pleasing each and every day of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. 514. We're marching to Zion. We're not walking. We're marching. All right? I 
Descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Let's just continue in prayer. Father, as we and before you this morning, we do so in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We rejoice to know you as our great God, to know that you are the Almighty, Omniscient One. Lord, it is overwhelming for us to try and consider how powerful and how uh, it is that you are everywhere at once, that you're all-knowing. Father, our finite minds cannot grasp the infinite truth of who you are. And Lord, when we think about that, and then we consider that you know us by name, uh, that Father, you sent your Son to be our Savior, uh, Father, is something which should truly humble us, and it does. We thank you that you did send your Son. We thank you that you so loved the world, that you sent your only begotten Son to be our Savior, to be a sacrifice for sin, to be the substitute, uh, to take the place that we should have had, and Father, to provide a way for us to be forgiven, for heaven to be made our home. Lord, we ask that as we gather together this morning to worship and to learn from your word, that we would truly know your presence among us. Father, for those who are unable to be here through sickness, we ask that you would uh, help them, that you would uh, grant them healing, and that we could soon see them back amongst us. Father, we pray that you would be magnified in, in each one of our lives, and whatever the need of each heart is here today, we pray that it would be met. But Lord, if there is one here who has never received you as Savior, then I pray that you would draw them to yourself, that you would make it clear to them that they have sinned, that they have broken your laws, and 
uh, the Father without a Savior, that they will one day end up in hell. But Lord, help them to know, to be assured of the truth, that if they come to you asking forgiveness because of Christ, then you will forgive them and receive them. And they can know for certain that they are your child. Father, for those of us who do know you, we pray that we would be drawn closer to you, and that, Father, we would be uh, able to say that today we grew in grace and knowledge. Father, we ask that in all these things you would be lifted high and praised and worshipped and adored as you alone deserve. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a reason for that. This is Terry Wickham who's now going to sing a special for us. song to sing if it's from our heart. Oh, how I love Jesus.
smiling faces here this morning. If you're a first-time visitor, we uh, welcome you especially, and if uh, you would endeavor us to fill out the visitor's card in front of you um, in the pew, I would appreciate it. We would like to learn some more about you, how we can pray for you, how we can minister to you. So we can fill that out, put it in the plate, give it to myself, the pastor, and one of the ushers. A few announcements. Um, we have an update directory form, church directory form, so if you're a tender of the church and a member of the church and um, you want to need something changed in the directory, it's back there on the, on the table. You can put that in there. If you would like to be in our church directory, you can fill out uh, that information also back there. Uh, we need to be praying for Wanda Ritchie. She is in the hospital at Bedford. She's having some weakness and pain issues, so we need to again keep her in prayer. Um, we'll be having communion service tonight at 7 p.m., so please endeavor yourself with that. Our man's prayer breakfast is next Saturday, April 13th at 8.30. And then uh, this Wednesday, April 10th, immediately following our prayer meeting, we'll have our uh, monthly business meeting. So if you remember, we encourage you to attend that. So this time we'll have uh, our ushers come forward for the offering. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are truly the awesome God, almighty creator of the universe, and we stand in, in awe of, of your greatness and how much you love us and care for us. And we just are truly only, only lowly sinners saved by your grace, Lord. We thank you for blessing our church, church in so many different ways. We ask that you would help us to return these offerings to you, Lord, to further the name of Jesus. We pray for, for Wanda as she's going through some difficulties and just strengthen her and encourage her, Lord, and we, we certainly just hold her up to you. We ask that you, to, again, bless this morning's service and bless these offerings. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>
you to, you're between three and seven. I'd like to go that way. That's time for Junior Church. I know you will enjoy your time down there. At this time, the rest of us are going to stand up, mill about, say something kind. If you can't say something kind to somebody, just don't say anything. <laughs> but do, do make everyone feel welcome. Great to have you. Thank you.
at 6 o'clock this evening, choir practice. Our leader, Ms. Wanda, is under the weather, but we're going to come and we're going to practice because we want to make her proud, and I'm telling you, this is a powerful 16-voice crowd. How are We haven't had that in years. Praise the Lord. Okay? So be here. Pastor. Again, good morning. I want to welcome each of you. And if you're visiting today, then we're very glad to have you with us. Uh, just one more thing before we turn to the, the scripture. Um, on the 28th of April, God willing, we'll be having a gentleman come by. And he has a ministry called Lens of the Harvest. And his desire is to um, shoot professional video to help churches and missionaries to, to really spread their message and explain who they are. So he's going to come, come by on April the 28th. And he's going to film different aspects of the building and of the, the service. And so if you can help me, I would really appreciate it. And the way you can do that is on the back table, spread across all the tables, um, there are some little forms that you can write down a word or a phrase that really sums up what the church means to you. And if you want to expand on it, then that's great as well. You can sign your name on the bottom and we'll kind of do a mini interview with you. And so it kind of gives a taste of what the church is about, who is here, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. And if you go to the website, um, you can see what he's already done. It's called lensoftheharvest.com. And it's something that we can put on social media, we can put on the website, we can put, you know, wherever we can. And it's just one other way of letting people know who we are, where we are, and the advantage of um, individual in the church being involved is that if people hear my voice on there, they may think they're listening to a video from the wrong country. <laughs> if they hear some of you, then they'll know, okay, this is local. So, you know, we need to make sure it's, it's rooted here in, in uh, Bedford, Pennsylvania. So, um, uh, those forms are on the back. If, if you want to speak to me about it first to see what would be involved, uh, then you can do that, and then you can sign up. Um, uh, Dan Milton's been doing a great job with getting the, uh, the special music arranged, and I think where there's a gap sometimes, he's just putting someone's name in and telling them later. So, <laughs> I don't know, maybe we'll do that. We'll just throw your name in there and uh, fill me on the day. No, I wouldn't do that really, but it would be a help. It, it, it's a way that we can, as I said, just do another, uh, use another avenue of getting the word out. And so, be in prayer about that and, and look forward to it. Um, he, he uses a drone. I think drones are cool, I, you know, things like that, gadgets. I've been really carried away with and so he'll hopefully be able to do some aerial shots of the church and um, so look forward to it and if you have any questions do, do speak with me. Uh, we're in Mark chapter 1 this morning then, Mark chapter 1 and we're going to be working our way through verses 9 through 13 and if you remember Mark is, is very uh, brief in the way that he presents things. He doesn't go into a lot of detail compared to some of the other gospels. Um, but he does have a very deliberate way of presenting truth. To give you some idea of, of how, more, how much more detail Matthew goes into, you know, according to uh, you know, the studies that have been done, the Gospel according to Matthew includes about 96% of the same material of Mark, and yet Matthew's Gospel is at least 12 chapters longer. So it goes into a lot more detail, and it's there for a reason. So Mark is very direct, he's brief, he's to the point, almost to the point of being blunt in some areas. Um, and again, he does it for a reason. And this morning, we're looking at the first few uh, elements of the earthly ministry of Christ, how he comes to John to be baptized, how he is then uh, spoken to by the Father from heaven, and then goes out into the wilderness to face that time of temptation. And all of these areas are expanded upon it in great detail in the other Gospels, but in Mark's Gospel, he does it in about four verses, four or five verses. And so you'll see how quickly he moves through it as we look at it today, and yet there's still much for us to learn. And as we combine these three events in the early life of Christ, we're going to see that really this was his pathway to public ministry. This was his pathway to service. All of these events are things that we can relate to in some way. You know, Jesus faced... Uh, gave us an example of obedience and submission. That's why he was baptized. Jesus received this word of commendation, of exaltation from the Father, and it uh, you know, set him on that path of fulfilling the purpose that was there for his life. 
And then there was a time of trial, a time of difficulty. And again, it was something which we see played out in the remainder of the life of Christ. And these, these are all elements that we will face as well. So let's just read through the text again. It's only a few verses. It says, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Now, one of the most famous American artists of the 20th century was born here in Pennsylvania. He was born over on the eastern side of the state, uh, eastern side of the state. And he became very famous, and some, you know, many of his works are known around the world, and they, they sell for vast sums of money. Now, Andy Wyeth, as his name was, were, was commissioned to a painting once, and it depicted a sycamore tree behind an old farm building. His brother knew that he was working on this particular painting, and he visited him one day, and he saw paintings of roots and of tree trunks, and he asked the brother, knowing what the general outline of the picture would be, he said, well, where are those going to be in the painting? And his brother explained, it's not in the picture. He said, for me to get what I want in the part of the tree that's showing, I've got to know thoroughly how it's anchored in the back of the house. So he was spending all this time painting something that would never be seen. Because for him to accurately depict what would be seen, he had to know in his mind completely what was behind the scenes. And with artists, it's very much that way. We don't always understand exactly what they're doing, but they're doing it for a purpose. There was a gentleman who used to come by the church I grew up in. Uh, his name was Daryl Coons, and again, a great artist. He's got paintings up in the White House. And he would do these chalk drawings. He would do the, these works of art in about 10 minutes as you watched it. And there was one occasion I remember particularly where he would do all this chalk, and again, he would do this work, and then it would eventually be hidden behind other things, but it was there, it was needful. And one time he got close to finishing and then he grabbed a black piece of chalk and he just drew a big line all the way down one side. And, I, and myself and others, we thought, he's ruined it. Maybe he got frustrated. Have you ever done that with a drawing? You just kind of got frustrated and you just kind of scribbled it out. Or maybe writing a letter and something went wrong and you scribbled it out. You know? But then he somehow turned that line into a tree. And it was amazing to see it happen. In Jesus' life here, there were things that would come later, but there had to be this preparation. There had to be these things that occurred behind the scenes. This was a time of the roots and the trunk taking shape, and it's the same way in our life. Sometimes we're anxious to do something. We're anxious to move forward, and you know, maybe we're kind of wondering what the Lord has for us in life. But it's a time for us to be prepared, a time for us to put down roots and for the trunk to gain strength, and then the Lord will use those times later on. So as we look through these verses this morning, I want us to keep those things in mind. The first thing then for us to take note of then, and then in the children's notes, is we see the baptism of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus. Now, one of the, this is one of those words that kind of confuses me, because baptize in America you spell with a, a Z, or a Z, if you're from where I am, or a Z. Do you spell baptize with a Z, or a Z, or an S? Okay, well, I don't even know that. <laughs> I thought it was with a Z, but apparently not. So, there you go. Anyway, baptism is with an S. So, I thought I was looking at another one of those words that just messed me up. Now I'm even more confused. <laughs> the baptism of Jesus here is covered very, very quickly. All it says in verse 9 is, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized. If it's, there's a Z. Baptized of John in Jordan. So, anyway, we know what the word means, even if I don't know how to spell it. Jesus has been in the world now. He was born into the world some 30 years previous to this. And he's lived a very ordinary life. He's lived really in obscurity. Nothing incredible has happened. All we know about the life of Christ is found in the Bible. There are stories that have gone around that were imagined, you know, hundreds of years ago. But all we know about the life of Christ is his birth, 
there was the event when he was uh, about 12 years old, when he was left behind um, in Jerusalem, when he'd gone up with his parents. And then there's silence until we reach the occasion when he begins his earthly ministry. Jesus is in the world. He grew up in Nazareth and Galilee. And you know, both of these places were held in contempt by the Jews. And that's the same in every country. There are perhaps segments of the country that get looked down upon by others. I know the town that I grew up in, grew up in was a relatively small town uh, called Newbury, and next to it there was a town called Thatcham. And even between those two towns, and they were so close together, it was almost like you couldn't tell where one ended and one finished. But the people of Newbury always used to tease the people of Thatcham because Newbury Sewage Works was built in Thatcham. And hundreds of years ago, there was a riot when the people of Newbury went over to Thatcham and destroyed their marketplace and then came back. There was this rivalry that's gone on for who knows how long. In the time of Jesus, Nazareth and Galilee was somewhere looked down upon by most of the rest of the nation. This is what the Pharisees would later say, can there any good thing come out of Galilee? Nazareth, who's despised as being irreligious and lacking in morals. But this is where Jesus was raised. This is where Jesus grew up in those early days. The baptism of Jesus here occurs. He's traveling alone. It's before the disciples have been called to follow him. And he was maybe the only individual from Galilee that was there. But why was he baptized? If you look back to verse 5, we, we saw this last week. It says, They went out unto him, all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. But of course, Jesus had no sins to confess. He was absolutely perfect, completely righteous. And it wasn't just uh, that it wasn't possible for Christ not to sin. It was impossible for Christ to sin. He has no sin to confess. He had nothing to repent of. But Jesus was baptized for a reason. When Jesus here was baptized, he was authenticating the forerunner John. He was saying, what he has told you is true. You can believe him. It was God telling John, in a sense, that you're on the right path. You've been doing the right thing. In his baptism, if we compare it with the account in Matthew chapter 3, uh, Matthew explains the answer of Jesus as initially John said that he should be baptized of Jesus and not the other way around. And in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15, Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. He was doing it as an example. He was acting submissively to the will of God the Father. He was doing what was necessary to be an example for us. In his baptism, Jesus was identifying with his fallen creation. Jesus was saying that he was here to become one of us, to suffer in our place. It's one of those little bits of the puzzle that starts to come together that makes sense at the end of his life. Have you ever been stood with someone or met someone that was famous or that was well known or that you respected and looked up to and you wanted to take their picture with them? Has it ever happened to you? You met a famous sports personality or perhaps a race car driver. There's only one person. Well, I guess there's more than one, but there's one in particular who I know may have done that. You know, have you ever met someone and you thought, you, are, you know, I want a record of this. And you maybe hand your camera or your phone to someone and you put your arm around them and you say, look, can you, can you take a picture of us? They want to be, you want to be identified with them. You want to say, look, I met this person, I know them. Now, how would it feel for you if that person kind of said, no, nah, it's okay. <laughs> how would you feel if someone said, look, I don't want anybody else to know we met. I don't want my picture taken with you. Would you, would you mind? <laughs> You'd be hurt, you'd be offended. What if it was someone that was really famous and really well respected and really well known and they came to you and said, hey, can I get my picture with you? I want to let my family know that we met. Would you be pleased? Would you say, wow, yeah, sure. That's a, can I get a copy of it? Imagine then what it means for us that Jesus here in his baptism 
is becoming one of us. He is aligning himself with us. He is living out the life of righteousness that we are unable to live. In his baptism, he is acting in submission to his heavenly Father, and he's acting in obedience. In Philippians chapter 2, and verses 6 through 7, Paul describes so well this submissive spirit of Jesus Christ when he says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death, or even the death of the cross. It describes God in relation to Abraham, that he was called the friend of God. Now we may have many friendships that we're pleased with and that we're proud of, but none of it compares to being called, being called the friend of God. So when we read here in verse 9 of Jesus being baptized, it's something we should stop and meditate upon. It shows his submission. And now the word submission is something which many of us may not like the idea of. We, we don't necessarily like being told what to do. We like to chart our own course. We like to be the one in command. Our flesh rears up and it likes to be the one that has authority. But here Jesus submits to the Father. And so as we are called upon to submit to one another, we should see it as a way in which we can imitate Christ. We are to submit to God absolutely. Uh, we are to submit to Him. We are to draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to us. We are to submit to one another. We are to take counsel of one another. We are to see the worth and the value of one another's walk with Christ so that we can be benefited by each other. To submit is not something which is a terrible thing. If Jesus Christ would do it to His Heavenly Father, then it's something which we should joyfully do when we obey Him. When we move on to verse 10, we see that Jesus is the beloved of God. Jesus is baptized of John in Jordan. It says, And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open, and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The dove was something that was meaningful to the people of Israel. The dove symbolized peace. It held significance to the Jews because it was among the only birds that were accepted for a Jewish sacrifice. This dove descending from heaven was something which the people would have taken note of and it signified the, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is one of those passages that is unique because we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all represented here, all present in some way. The Spirit descended here authenticates and empowers the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not become the Christ, as some false teachers would say. Jesus was God in the flesh from the very beginning. We always need to be careful of that. If we ever wonder what someone else believes, then where we need to start is with Jesus Christ. If they believe that Jesus was just a regular man who became Christ, well then there's a problem. What has happened in here is that Jesus' earthly ministry is being authenticated, it's being uh, launched as it were, it's the Father empowering Him to some degree, but Jesus was and is and always has been and always will be the second person in the Trinity, that uh, one in whom the fullness of the Godhead is represented in a bodily form. The descending Spirit was noticed by the people. But take note of what He says, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, the word beloved, it's got a connection with, with only Son. If you think of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You know, it's something which is important. It's one of those differences that is, is worth noting. If we say that for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, well, what does that mean of us who've been adopted into His family as the children of God? In 2 Corinthians, it talks about us being made the sons and daughters of God. But it's very specific when it says His only begotten Son. There's something unique about the relationship of the Father and of the Son here. And this is the Son that is beloved. 
But what I want to really draw your attention to is this. The commendation was given before any miracles took place. John makes it clear that when Jesus went up to Cana in Galilee and he was invited to the wedding there, and it's seemingly a significant, I think, that Christ's first miracle took place at a wedding. But it says that that was his first miracle. It was the beginning of miracles in Jesus' earthly ministry. So Jesus hasn't committed, uh, performed any miracles at this point. Jesus has lived just a regular life of obedience to his heavenly Father. We can't imagine what the dynamics would have been amongst that family with Joseph and Mary and then other sons and daughters that were born into that family. We can't imagine what it would be like for Big Brother to be the Son of God. It's not revealed to us. There's no specifics given. And so I think we need to be careful as to how far we begin to imagine that. But Jesus had lived, as far as we know, just an ordinary life. He had probably, as the firstborn son, been the one that was taken over from Joseph in the family business as a carpenter. But there were no miracles. There were no great crowds who'd come out to listen to him. And, you know, when he did start this, his earthly family began to rebuke him. And some of his brothers almost seemed to say, well, what are you doing, Jesus? Who do you think you are? And although he's only lived an ordinary life in the wise of the world, God the Father says to him, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Two passages in the Old Testament were combined in Psalm 2 verse 7. Uh, the psalmist writes, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. In Isaiah 42 verse 1, it says, Behold my servant to my abode, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. And these two verses we see combined as the Father speaks to the Son and says, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Son here, Jesus Christ, is commended and praised, not because of anything He's done, but because of who He is to the Father. And you know, that should encourage us. That should bless us. That our Heavenly Father, He looks upon us and He loves us, not because of what we do, not because of anything we have done or anything we will do, but He loves us because we are His children. Our worth is not found in what we can do. Our value to God is not found in any kind of the successes that this world speaks of. There were certain things in my life that I had anticipated having accomplished by the time I turned 40 years old. And some of those things I'm not going to accomplish. Now, I don't mind. You know, I'm happy with what the Lord has led to me in my life. I'm humbled by what God has blessed me with in life. There is no discontent whatsoever. But in human terms, there are some things that if I'd been able to do them, then some people in the world may have thought something of that. You know, to God it doesn't make any difference. God doesn't look at me and say, well, you know, you were hoping to be working on your third doctorate by the time you were 40. Didn't get that done. Or your second doctorate. Or your first doctorate. <laughs> but God doesn't say, well, you're of less value to me. God loves us because He's chosen to love us. We never deserved His love in the first place. And we live in a world that puts so much value upon things that God says it's just temporary. And it's going to pass away. Thou art my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Because you're my Son. And God looks upon us in just the same way. Now, we will still want to please the Father. We still want to uh, strive to obey Him and be used of Him. And that's good. But He already loves us. God looks at me, knowing my absolute worst sins, knowing all of the transgressions that I ever had committed, ever will commit. God knows things about me that nobody here ever will. Things that I thought, things that I was ashamed of and had to ask forgiveness for. God knew all those things and He said, I want to save you anyway. I choose to love you anyway. That's grace. It's the undeserved blessing of God, the undeserved favor of God. 
And we need to know here this morning that God has chosen to love us. Now, I'm not making much of us, because as I've said, it's not because of anything we've done. It's making much of Him. It's saying what a great God He is, that He would choose to love me. That He would choose to love you. If we think of those throughout history, William Carey. William Carey is thought of as a, as a great success in the eyes of the world and in the eyes of the church. He labored in India and he was able to see countless thousands come to Christ. He learned more languages than I think I could even begin to know exist. And he loved them. He, he created alphabets for some of the languages that he translated the Bible into. He started schools and he started the oldest and still existing newspaper in India. The oldest newspaper started was by William Carey. By any measure, he was a success. Did you know he was in India for six years before he saw anybody come to Christ? Six years he labored and saw virtually nothing come as fruit. What if William Carey had died in year five and none of those other things he ever accomplished came to pass? Do you think God would think of him any less? Not at all. God loved William Carey because he was his son. And so it is with us. We need to know today that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The commendation from the Father was something which was needful, I believe, in the human side of Jesus. We noted on Wednesday that the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in all points such as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows the feelings of our infirmities. He knows what it is to have a heavy heart. Jesus, as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane before being crucified the day after, would sweat drops of blood as the burden of what was about to come were laid upon him. He knew what it was to be anxious, to be cast down. He knew what it was to feel abandoned on the cross when he'd cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knows where each and any, every one of us is today, spiritually and emotionally. And we need to understand that he has chosen to bestow his love upon us. We see the baptism of Jesus. We see the beloved of God. And the final thing in verses 12 through 13 is that there is a spiritual battle. Immediately the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. That word drive is a powerful word. It is the same word used in Mark chapter 1 and down in verse 34. It says, He healed many that were sick of divers diseases and cast out many devils. The, the same word there for cast out is the word driven in verse 12. So it's almost like the Holy Spirit is there. We see that Jesus is baptized and then the Holy Spirit casts Jesus out into the wilderness. He drives him to another place for a time and for a purpose. I wonder if you know what it's like to be so compelled by the Holy Spirit that you knew there was something you had to do, something that you had to say, some portion of Scripture that you just had to study. You were driven by God and you knew exactly what He wanted you to do. If not, I would ask you, pray that God would make something clear to you, know that He's leading you, and it's not going to be, you know, clouds in the sky. God doesn't work with these massive outward signs ordinarily. I remember growing up trying to decide where God wanted me to go to university, and I was considering a university here in America and a couple of other places, and there was a storm at the time, and I stood out in the front of my house. I lived on a street of fir, a lane called Fir Tree Lane. Do you know what kind of trees they had on Fir Tree Lane? Fir trees. <laughs> And there was a row of fir trees across the street from where I lived. And I'd read something, I'd seen a movie most likely, and I just thought, Lord, if you want me to go to this particular university, then just send a bottle of light in, make it clear to me. I'm so desperate, I need a sign. And I was thinking of, you know, Old Testament things. And not long after that, within moments, there was a bolt of lightning that hit one of the trees across the street. And it was so close. If you've ever experienced that, when you smell the air is burnt, and the sound is just deafening, the light and the thunder come at the same time, 
and I found myself back inside the house without remembering how I got there. <laughs> and you know, I still didn't know what God wanted me to do, but I knew not to ask for lightning again. <laughs> You know, God doesn't work in those outward signs. We want it to be clouds in the sky spelling out something, an arrow pointing in a particular direction. But you know, when the Spirit lets us know something, it's, it's in our hearts. With Elijah, it wasn't in the thunder or the earthquake or the fire. It was a still, small voice. God speaks to us through His Word, and His Holy Spirit leads us. Jesus here is driven out into the wilderness. And Mark describes something. Remember, Mark is a man of action. He's writing to a people of action who are used to the Colosseum. And so Mark includes something here that the other writers of the Gospel do not. And he gives us this little detail. And he was with the wild beasts. Remember, there were wild animals in this place. And Jesus was out there with no place to live or stay. He didn't have the weapons that we might be familiar with to defend ourselves. Jesus was baptized, and he wasn't planning a journey into the wilderness. Jesus here wasn't expecting for there to be a camping trip. He was driven into the wilderness immediately after his baptism, still driven wet from having been in the River Jordan, and the Spirit tells him, go to the wilderness, and he's there with the wild animals. I have to wonder if creation recognized their creator at all. I think more than likely the wild animals under the curse just as much as anything else. Those wild animals, just like sinful humans, were just out to get him. They didn't look at Jesus and these mountain lions or bears or whatever else may have been there didn't look upon him and say, well, there is our creator. They just looked upon him as another piece of flesh for them to attack. And we may be astounded by that. How could creation not recognize its creator? You've heard the phrase about biting the hand that feeds you. How much more so did human beings reject their creator? John opens his gospel with that. That the word became flesh... And it says that the people that were his own did not receive him. His own received him not. Jesus is out there in the wilderness alone. The wild animals are there. If you've ever been out in the wilderness and heard the wild animals starting to call, it can be a fearful thing. And as maybe you grow older, or if you're prepared to meet those wild animals, then it may not sound such a fearful thing. But it can be a scary thing to be in the wilderness and hear animals out there in the dark that could possibly hurt you and harm you. Jesus, apart from the physical side of it, was under constant temptation. Satan was there looking to bring him low, to defeat him. But it also says that the angels ministered unto him. We have an example here in Christ that Jesus resisted temptation. That although the world seemed to be turned against him and that he was on his own, the Lord had a way of upholding him. He would quote scripture as Satan would tempt him. And although there were three occasions that are highlighted, I believe this whole period of 40 days was a time of temptation. But there are lessons we can only learn in the wilderness. When we're in the wilderness, we can learn that God is all we need. When we're in the wilderness, a spiritual wilderness, we understand that the spiritual battle is real. But we also understand that God can protect us. That He can sustain us. And as we grow older and as we mature, we begin to understand that every period of time in the wilderness is a time of preparation to use us in the future. As we consider the portion of Scripture before us this morning, think about the baptism. It marked a point of dedication, not in the eyes of God, but to others. And I wonder if there's ever been a time for you when you specifically spoke to the Lord and said, Lord, use me. Lord, I want you to use my life. It's yours. When we pass around the plate and then offerings are made, it's us saying, Lord, or it ought to be a part of us saying, Lord, you've given me so much. Lord, I want to give you back a portion of what you've blessed me with. 
And you know, the beginning of giving isn't with the wallet or the purse, but it's with the heart. And we need to have that point of dedication with our lives, with our talents and our time and our being, where we say, Lord, use me. And if you've never had that time in your life, if you're a child of God, then may I encourage you, would you say to the Lord today, Lord, use me. And if you do that, I would encourage you to make it known to one of us, say, look, the Lord did something in my heart today. I want it known that God has put a call on my life. And whether it's to be a missionary on some foreign field, or whether it's to be a faithful servant in a place of work where He places us, we need that time of saying, Lord, use me. And then daily and moment by moment, choose and submit to the Lord. Do you understand that you are the beloved of God as well? Not the only begotten as Jesus Christ was, but that God loves you. And that we need to see our affirmation, our commendation from Him first and foremost. Do you know that God loves you and that there is a value placed upon your life which is infinite because it comes from the infinite God? And are you aware that there is a spiritual battle that is raging? That there are forces at work to tempt you to sin, to tempt those who are around you to sin? And we need to be engaged in this battle. We need to be playing our part to bring glory to God, to give the gospel to others. I'm going to ask if you would bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. We're going to sing our final hymn. But before we do, I want you to take a moment and pray for the Lord to work in your life. And it may be something completely different from what we've been looking at, from what I've said. But let God speak to you. Think of the scriptures that we've looked at. If you've never asked God to forgive you because of your sins, then may that be today that you do that. When you come to the Lord and you know that He forgives you and receives you. And if you are a child of God, then let's submit to Him. Let's listen to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us through His Word. And let us be willing to obey whatever it may be that He calls upon us to do. I'm going to close in prayer and then, uh, if Dan, if you can come and lead us in our final hymn. But let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, I pray that you would do a work in us today, whatever it may be, that you may be glorified, that we would be not only challenged by your word, but also changed. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
song reminds me of the night I walked the aisle and received as my Savior, November 7, 1971, at 9 o'clock in the evening. And I felt that failed you so many ways over the years, but I knew it was real then, and I know it's real yeah. then. And I would pray that if anybody hasn't made that decision, that today would be the day. I thank you for the salvation you extended to me, and I thank you for the opportunity to become in your prayer this day. Bless this church and each person that's in it. In your holy name, I pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God.